Welcome to the HEAL Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan Gorris, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. And I've discovered on my journey that so much more is possible than we can begin to imagine. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Heal Podcast. Today, I have a wonderful woman in the off, uh, in the studio. <laughs> Her name is Marissa Peer. She is a world-renowned therapist. Um, she uses hypnotherapy a lot in her work. I actually was a client of hers a few years ago. I feel like you were. I, you, I was blessed enough to have you do some work on me. Um, she's the founder and creator of RTT, a new and exciting multi-award winning therapy taking the world by storm, which I'm so excited to learn about. Marissa has spent over three decades treating a client list that includes international superstars, CEOs, royalty, and Olympic athletes. The best of the best. A best-selling author of five books, Marissa has been heralded as one of the most powerful transformers of human behavior and one of the few women in history to have a profound impact on the field of hypnotherapy. Welcome oh, to the show. Blush. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's quite a resume. Yeah, that thing about being one of the few women is such a lovely thing. When someone wrote that, I love that. Yeah, I know, you're a powerhouse. Well, you know, because therapy's always been such a male-dominated world, you know, Freud, and and yet women are much better at therapy. I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> they, have, they, they, they have more empathy, so it's great to make an impact in the field of therapy like that. I totally agree. I totally agree. So tell me a little bit more about this... RTT. So, you know, I when I became a therapist, I was a little baffled by therapy is the only healing modality that says, bring me your pain, and we're going to discuss it for years. <laughs> Nobody says, I'm going to the chiropractor to talk about my bad, but I'm going to the dentist to discuss my cracked tooth. I'm going to the doctor to talk about my knee being out. When you turn up in pain at the chiropractor or the dentist or the doctor, they say, let me get you out of pain as fast as I possibly can. We're going to look at the cause of the pain. We're going to get you out of pain at the same time. But therapy says, let's have a discussion about the pain. And they said, I do understand what they say. You need to trust me to get better. But you see, I went into anaphylactic shock in New York, and I didn't say to the ambulance, I need to trust you. I went, Give me the EpiPen. My mouth's running like a puffer fish. I can hardly breathe. I trusted them because they were in an ambulance. Mm. And I remember thinking, well, surely therapy should be the same. We should say, let's get you out of pain. You're in pain, whether the pain is I get stress headaches or the pain is I can't find love or the pain is I lack confidence or I blush all the time or I can't pursue my dreams. That's all pain. It's not physical pain, but it's pain. And I thought, well, why doesn't therapy offer what every other healing modality offers? So I decided I was going to create a course that said, bring me your pain. We're going to get rid of that starting in session one. We're not going to, we're going to still talk about, we're going to get rid of the pain first. And so I called it rapid transformation because it's rapid and transforming in one session. And a lot of people said to me, that's terrible. The words rapid shouldn't go with therapy. I said, why not? Who told you that? And why is that even true? They said, you should never put the word rapid. Somebody wrote to me and said, therapy is a tremendous journey of pain. Trying to crawl out of the pain, it's long, it's arduous. And I'm like, who said that? <laughs> and why is that even true? Because when you question a belief, it doesn't have to be true. And I've been doing this for, gosh, over 35 years. I've trained 17,000 therapists all over the world. And none of them say... It's so long ago, wow, this is amazing. And the thing people say the most is, gosh, I've been in therapy for 10 years. I found out something in 20 minutes with you, or five minutes, or an hour. And um, it's a wonderful thing that you can get people out of pain faster, because when people are in pain, they have one question. Can you get me out of pain? Mm. Can you make me feel better? Can you make me feel good? Can you stop it hurting? The answer is yes. And why shouldn't it be fast? And you're talking mostly about emotional pain, correct? But is it? But it's often then tied to physical pain. So what have you? Well, you know, there are two types of pain. There's the, you know, people turn up and say, you know, I have irritable bowel. I have, you know, terrible. Di I have insomnia. I have contact dermatitis. We have a lot of 
physical things, and, and I know you just interviewed Joe Dispenza, and I always say that 70% of people turning up at the doctors have real pain, but it's not caused by diseased organs, it's caused by disease. And Joe says 90%. But imagine that, we're turning up, you know, we have real migraines, real stomach ache, real gut issues, real skin problems, they are mostly caused by diseased thinking. They are not really, because some people have things caused by disease organs, of course. So we have two things, we have the physical pain, I get stress headaches, my skin breaks out, I have panic attacks, I stutter, I stammer, I'm an alcoholic, I'm an addict. So that would we call that physical pain? And then we have the other pain, which is I can't find love, I self-sabotage, I self-destruct, I procrastinate, I mess everything up, or you know, I, I, I'm, everything I do, I'm in self-destruct. So that's more of an emotional pain. But we treat them both the same, because they all cause you pain, whether it's the pain of got another headache, another panic attack, another stress, or... or Another relationship's just gone down the tubes. Mm. It, it's all painful. Mm -hmm. You don't have to say, where's the pain come from? You just say, Let, let's get rid of the pain. Why live in pain when you don't have to? Well, it's so interesting that you're bringing this up because I've had a stress headache for three days. Wow. This is day three. And I, I call it a tension headache because I, I haven't been stressed. I traveled on Saturday. It was a long travel day. Went to an event. was around you know, at a basketball arena with thousands of people we're drinking alcohol, but nothing like crazy, mm -hmm. just socially. And then, you know, um, so I, I woke up in the morning and I wasn't hungover, I wasn't stressed, but I just felt a little dehydrated. And then throughout the day, the tension just starts like pulling my, and it's always my upper right shoulder becomes like a rock and then it shoots a pain into the base of my skull here and it wraps around my eyeball. And it, you know, I, I don't cause it a, my, I don't call it a migraine because I always know that it's mm -hmm. kind of an origin in dehydration. Um, but they've been lasting for like three days, and you know, so as you're saying, you know, there's there's a root cause that's probably mm -hmm. mental. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I wasn't conscious that I was stressed, but there must be because it's this pattern, and it's yeah. always in the same location. It goes in my mm. jaw, and it's just, and you know, I ha I don't take medication for anything mm. unless it's you know so now I have to take Advil for three days and that and then it kind of relaxes on its own but it takes three days mm. to unwind so interesting that there well, I can get rid of that for you now and <laughs> what it, in the next hour I can remove that if you'd like me to I mean yes let's do that because you see the thing is you know people say you know when I'm stressed my back goes or I get an upset stomach or I break out so the body has one way in, in your case it's headaches but um Interesting to find out why that keeps happening and get mm. rid of it. And it's been recent. It's, it's been a last couple of years. So. Mm. But also you have to learn to kind of talk to yourself better. So let's just say, oh, I always get a stress headache after I've taken a long flight. Or, you know, it's always on a Monday morning when I go back to work. Or it's always after this, you know, Halloween or Christmas or New Year mm -hmm. or Thanksgiving. And so you're setting up an expectation, and here's one of the rules of the mind. What is expected almost always tends to be realized. So we've got to be very aware of our expectations. And then some other rules of the mind that really help are that every thought you think creates a physical reaction and an emotional response. That every thought you think is not a thought, it's a blueprint that your mind, body, and psyche work to make real. So people will say, you know, I've got my seasonal allergies, or it's hay fever season, it's flu season, it's cold season. And of course, you're setting up an expectation, not understanding that your mind's job is to make your thoughts real. It's not like it has a choice in that. This is a job of your mind. Make your thoughts real. So if you think a sad thought, your eyes fill up with tears. Think of an embarrassing thought, you go bright red. For guys, think of a sexual thought. You normally get an erection, even if you're sitting at home, thinking, oh my God, I wasn't planning that. Think of food, your tummy rumbles. And then here's the biggest thing, the placebo. What you think about a drug will affect you more than what's in it. People take amphetamines, go, that's the set to go to sleep, mm. and vice versa. People get high on stuff that isn't even real. So our mind every day is making our thoughts real. That's its job, and our job is to think, okay, I should upgrade these thoughts, update these thoughts, stop saying, 
I've got my migraine. I've got my allergies. Oh, I get sick if I eat that. I get fat just looking at a cake. I always get breakouts after um, uh, an event or I always suffer, you know, when I'm on a plane, I always, I get every virus going because you can choose what to think, but your body has no choice. It must act in a way that lines up with your thinking. And if you could look in your body and see what those thoughts do, you would think, okay, I'm, I'm not going to ever say I'm chronically tired, I'm massively stressed, I'm burnt out, I'm falling apart, I'm losing my shit. All these things that we say that are super descriptive. And of course, the way you feel about everything is down to two things. The pictures you make in your head and the words you say. And you just described in a very descriptive way the headache. It was really good. <laughs> but of course, when you describe it like that, you're always going to let me make it. When you say I've got a tiny little niggle, a little, little minor silly thing, the mind's going to make that real too. So we have to learn to minimize the description for illnesses and maximize the description for wellness. I love that. And why do we, I mean, I've heard so many versions of like thoughts that come into, mm. uh, the thoughts even aren't ours, right? They're in the field, oh, yeah. they're in our, so what makes us fixate on a thought? Like it, almost like the, we, we focus on the negative ones or the, the, the fearful ones and that's why we go, like we're fixating on the wrong thoughts it yeah. feels like. Cause they're all there, floating yeah, so around. A lot of people say to me, you know, so when you see clients, and some of it is really deep, and some people have it, that's when they go, how do you not take that in if you're working with someone who's been abused, who's been ill, who's, who's lost a much-loved baby? I mean, how do you not go home? Said, well, that's a belief, isn't it? If I believe I'm absorbing it all, then I'm going to act like that, and I've got to have the crystals and the healing sound bath and have a shower and what I said, but, but I don't believe that. I believe the minute someone comes to me is the day they get better. And although we hear a lot of horror stories, I still think, but this is the day they get better. And what does a surgeon, when they're operating on a baby that's been in a car, they don't go, oh my God, I'm taking, they just do their work. And then they go on to the next one. So a lot of people say, you know, as a therapist, you must take it all in, all the pain, all the, I'm like, no. I don't believe that. I believe that I'm doing a phenomenal job and every client's going to be improved from working with me or one of my graduates because we do have this amazing method. It's not me, it's the technique I teach. And so you always have to go back and go, okay, you know, a belief is nothing more than a thought you think a lot. So if you say, oh, I'm so stressed in the store, you know, I'm hypersensitive to light or noise or sound, so I can't be in the cinema, I can't be in the park, I can't be in the store. You have to think, well, where does that belief come from? Because that's an issue. I always say, where does this belief come from? Because when you question the belief, you already don't really believe it. You know, when your kid says, Mommy, how does the reindeer get down the chimney? <laughs> it's big. How does Santa Claus get all around the world? Uh, or my little girl said, Mummy, Father Christmas has got the same wrapping paper as us. <laughs> you think, oh, they're starting to question it. How does he know I'm a girl? How did he know? And why didn't he bring me the thing I asked for, but the thing I didn't ask for? The minute you question a belief, you're introducing doubt. So a very good thing is to question that belief. Why do I believe that this is stress thing? This makes me sick. This bothers me. Why do I believe, oh, every Thanksgiving I'm going to gain five pounds? It's Thanksgiving to Christmas. People said to me the other day, there's this freshman 10 pound. Mm -hmm. Everyone gains 10 pounds when they go to college. Really? I mean, not everyone does. But you go, everyone does, and it always happens. Mm -hmm. So where does that belief come from? Who told it to you? Was it true? And even if it's true for them, is it true for you? Like people used to say, Oh, you'll never find love at 50. You've got more chance of being attracted by a Martian than mm -hmm. finding love at 50. Or you can't get pregnant after. Your fertility falls off yeah. a cliff when you're 30. You know, if in England, if you go for an x-ray, it says on the x-ray, this client is between 12 and 52. Make sure they're not pregnant before the x-ray. It doesn't say 35. It says 52. Oh, I love that. 52. Reframe your beliefs. So it doesn't fall off a cliff at 35 at all. And when women were having 18 babies, where did they think they started when they were 10? <laughs> they had the first baby maybe at 17 or 18, not 16. And of course, when you breastfeed, you can't get pregnant for probably another six months. And most people had 18 months between babies, or at least a year. So 
18 babies, start at 17, that, now you're 35. And of course, 35 100 years ago was more like 55. Yeah. So you're gonna think, well, that's not even true. And here's the thing, you know, when I was a kid at school, they said, you must never do heavy petting. You know, one sperm can get out there and <laughs> swim up there, make you pregnant. And then they go, you don't have 100 million sperm, so you can't get pregnant. It's like, hang on, you just said one, when I, one can make me pregnant. Now you've said my partner hasn't got 500 million, I can't get pregnant. So for every belief you believe, you'll find a contradiction. Mm. And that's very important. So I don't have to believe that. I don't have to listen to this. I don't have to believe it. I can choose to have agency over what I let in. And so, you know, one of my um, very dear friends was told, only 20% of people with this cancer survive. She goes, well, I'm in that 20% then. I'm going in that 20%. 20%, I'm in the 20%. It's a great belief rather than, oh. And when people go for IVF, they do this really weird thing. They say, it has a 25% success rate, usually by the third time. What a stupid thing. So what people hear is, <laughs> It have a 75% failure rate, and it's not gonna work on the first two times. Mm -hmm. So we've gotta really learn to say, this is gonna work now, this is gonna work immediately. You're super fertile, you've got grade A eggs, fantastic womb. Your husband's sperm is like crack, military is string straight, <laughs> there's plenty of it, but you only need one. Yeah. You only need one. So we, we hear a lot of stuff that we let in it's really damaging and yeah. we have to sort of start to filter it filtering it makes a big difference and understanding the power of language and how yeah. that really you know perpetuates statistics oh yeah mostly dismal so yeah. to like i've always i've always had this thing that my producer adam calls newnonian because mm. uh, <laughs> kelly noonan newnonian statistics because it's like statistics don't really matter. They it's it's binary. It's like it's either gonna happen or it's yeah. not. Like you're either gonna heal or you're not. You're either gonna yeah. pregnant or you're not. So everything to me is 50-50. Yeah. So I just like, I don't know. I just have a different way of looking at statistics. I was talking to someone this weekend who has cancer. I said, look, here's the thing. The cancer can't live without you, but you can live without it. So you've already won because for the cancer to win, you have to both die. So the cancer's already going to lose whatever happens because yeah. it can only end in death, but you can win. So you're already ahead of the cancer. And then she, and I was saying, and she was saying, my cancer is not yours. Never call something my that you don't want. My is an ownership word. because so mm. I've got my migraine, I've got my tension headache, I've got my sinus infection, my cancer. You must never call something my unless you want to keep it forever. You have to call it the. So it's a very simple switch, mm. the cancer, the headache, the um, whatever, but you can say my fantastic immune system, yeah. my amazing metabolic rate, my fantastic um, coping skills. My fantastic ovaries and yeah, fertility. Yeah, my amazing yeah. grade A, yeah. over sort of eggs. luminous yeah. grade A premium <laughs> eggs. Yeah, when you learn to like accentuate the positive and minimize the negative, big up the good stuff and minimize the other stuff, that in itself would change your entire life. Yeah, exactly. I've always said, you know, in this country, in, in the world, we're kind of like, you get a cancer diagnosis and you immediately just go into contraction because we associate cancer with death. Yeah. And to overcome is like a, you know, is, is, is that smaller statistic, you yeah. know? And, and I say, you know, let there be a death, let there be a death of the old person or the old lifestyle yeah. or the old environment that allowed the yeah. cancer to exist and let the cancer die. Yeah. Um, but you, it doesn't have to be a death of you. Let's, yeah. let's be reborn into a healthy person with a, it, yeah. a beautiful, inner, vibrant inner terrain that cancer cannot Sure, exist. and you can do that. You know, you have tremendous power, you know, with cancer, there's so many things you can do. Take out parabens, you know, make sure you're not using toothpaste or shampoo or particularly dishwasher detergent that's full of parabens. Take some great supplements. Do not sleep with your mobile phone by your head or any EMFs by your head. Put them all at least seven feet away. Do a lot of visualization and change everything. Like one of my favorite expressions is every stage is a dream that's dying or one that's coming to birth and mm -hmm. so someone said to me recently what's it like getting older i'm like well it's better than the alternative <laughs> it's a gift some people never get the joy of getting older some people you know my best friend died when i was 18 of cancer oh. so she never had that joy of having a baby getting married 
So people say, oh, I'm getting older. It's like, yeah, lucky you. Some people don't get that. That's also a gift. So I think the big thing is learning to reframe everything. Mm. You know, I, I had cancer, endometrial cancer, and obviously when they told me, I was like, oh, my God, I felt so well. I didn't feel ill. I, thought, I can't have cancer. I don't even feel ill. But then I did, and when they told me, after two, for the first two days, it was like, oh, and then I thought, wow, what a stroke of luck. I got it in my womb. I don't even need a womb. I'm never going to use my womb again. <laughs> I got a great child, and so I just, well, I'll have that removed then. And, and then I had that removed, and it's nothing having a hysterectomy nowadays, nothing. So I went home the same day, and the next day I kept thinking, well, I don't have it. I had it, and now I don't have it. And um. I just would sing this little song to myself. You know that song, I feel pretty mm -hmm. and witty and gay. Every day I'd sing, the cancer's leaving, disappearing, it's fading every day. And I would just sing that song because I was sending a message mm. to my brain. And when people say, are you a cancer recoverer? I'm like, no, I don't have it. I haven't had it. I'm never having it again. Me and cancer are done. And we would say, like, oh, I'm a cancer recoverer too. And I said, no, no, I'm not that. I, I don't have it. Let's not even talk <laughs> about it. So for a long time, I didn't talk about it because it was, I don't want to keep talking mm -hmm. about it. When I began to talk about it, because I, what I did was every day I'd say, my body is a wellness-making machine. It mm -hmm. only knows wellness, only wellness, always wellness. And immediately I went from fear to power, not oh my God, this thing is going to kill me. My body is a wellness-making machine. It's making NK natural killer cells, and all it knows is wellness. And that was very good for me. People said, oh, I like, can I have that? I'm like, sure. So I began to talk about it a bit to help other people say, look, the diagnosis is down to the doctor. The recovery is up to you. You know, you can get diagnosed with anything. When I had my baby many years ago, I was in hospital and they literally came around with some Kleenex and said, that's for you. I said, what's that? Well, they said, that's a postnatal depression. <laughs> that Kleenex. arrives on day three. I went, oh no, I'm having postnatal euphoria. I've already signed up for it. I said, and they looked at me like I was mad. They went, I said, no, I'm, I'm having postnatal euphoria. I was told I could never have a baby, never get pregnant, never carry a baby, never deliver a normal baby. And since I have, I'm already in it. And on day three, I'll still be in postnatal euphoria and stop telling me to expect I mean imagine that giving you the Kleenex mm -hmm. saying expect it it's coming and then you think oh well it must be coming yeah they said it was coming the Kleenex are here that's a terrible thing to expect depression anxiety mm -hmm. because oh you know when you have a baby you can never even have a shower so what are you talking about they sleep all the time yeah <laughs> you know that's the belief and it's exhausting well it can be but it doesn't have to be. Yeah, yeah language is so powerful. I've seen you get really fat and you never lose that weight again. <laughs> yeah. Lots of people have had four kids and they're not really fat and they go, well, that didn't happen to me. So if you're into that kind of projection, find someone the opposite, someone who's got four kids and is doing really well, or one kid, or who said, oh, I went straight back to work, it was wonderful. Mm -hmm. So it, you, whatever, that's another rule of mine, whatever you look for, you will find mm. it. You know, and you, so you've got to look for better stuff and you can't be in two lanes. I want a baby, but oh, it's hell. I want a child, but you know, the sleepless nights and it, and it also goes so quickly having a baby. You'll say, I can't get the baby out of my bed. Well, I promise you at 18, they won't be in your bed. They'll yeah. be in someone else's bed. You'll think, oh, now I miss those days. I had my little baby in bed with me because I don't even know whose bed they're in now. Oh, gosh, yeah. But it's, it's always important to just pick a better belief mm -hmm. and then just teach yourself to believe that because after all, you know, you make your beliefs. But then they turn around and make you, and then you have something called confirmation bias, where you look for proof of what you have chosen to believe. Mm -hmm. You always get sick in the winter, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So you've made the belief. It's, it's actually now made you. And believe me, if you look for proof of what you've chosen to believe, of course you're going to find it. So how you said this, you were talking about this earlier, but I, I'm, I'm just wondering how you handle this because you are you, you're a therapist you deal with horrific stories and stories of abuse and people that are trying to heal these old wounds that keep presenting themselves and um in different ways throughout their adult life because they haven't healed these past mm. wounds 
But all these horror stories, all the horror stories we are seeing in the world right now, yeah. how do you not take that on? How do we believe that, like, how do we stay positive or not get sucked into that conditioning and fear and those beliefs that, like, the world is a dangerous place and there's so much hatred and polarity and all this, all this horrific stuff that's going down and mass shootings yeah. and wars and how do we stay engaged but detached like yeah. what is that healthy balance so that you know there are mass shootings there are wars there's a terrible situation in the middle east right now that's just awful but there's also still life is still wonderful people fall in love people do wonderful things miracles happen people have babies and so again, you've got to focus on what, you, where are you, where are you, what are you looking for? Because you're going to find it. And, you know, I always think life is amazing and life is wonderful, and you've got to look for the good stuff. And of course, there is the bad. It's like a weave of a cloth. You can't just have the good. There's the bad. You have a baby. What if it dies? I love my partner. What if they die? And then you think, well, you know, maybe they will. But I'll always be glad I had that. You know, I mean, I, I couldn't have a baby in case it died. I couldn't find love in case they left me. So you have to kind of do this reframe. And you know, I'm a great believer that you've got to fix your wounds because if you don't fix your wounds, you bleed on the people that never cut you. They didn't cut you, but you're bleeding all over them. So it's important to go back and fix you. It's important to go back and say, yeah, my childhood was shit. Because for some people it is, it was awful. But if your life was a massive clock, your childhood is the first five minutes. And you've got loads, I mean, look at people like, you know, Tony Robbins, Eminem, Louise Hay. They, I mean, Wayne Dye was raised in a children's home. Mm -hmm. Louise Hay never knew her dad and was raised in pretty much poverty. There are people all over who said, I had an awful life, but here I am, and it just gets better every day. And it made them and alchemized yeah. them to yeah. who they are and, and what their gifts are that they're expressing. And really, there are people who are ruined by a good childhood because nothing, will, they say, my dad and mom was so in love and, and I can't find that love or it was so amazing and it's not like that anymore. So amazingly, sometimes a bad child can give you something called, I'll show you. I mean, I had that, my parents, I always had that thing. They thought I was stupid and I wouldn't amount to much. And I had very, that I'll show you. And I was, I had that determination to show them because my brother went to private school and my sister, but I didn't. Oh, wow. I went to the regular state school. I was not the one who was going to succeed. But it was very good for me. You know, you don't always want to have a perfect childhood because it doesn't always give you drive and ambition. And I work with many people who give their kids Porsches for their 18th birthday, but and it's just, they give them everything except one thing, the drive to go out and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it's the reframe. I mean, and, and one of the things I do find, and your audience might find it very helpful, is this. Is your problem someone else's fantasy dream? Can kind of, someone say, well, I'd love a kid keeping, I'd love a husband leaving his pants on the floor. I'd love, you know, to have to commute to work for an hour on the 405 every day. That's a problem. That's my fantasy. Mm. And the second question to ask yourself is, what would you have given for this fantasy 10 years ago? And I was having dinner with a girl recently. I best said, oh my God, tomorrow I've got to go and, you know, do a thing and I'm going on television. So it's just, I said, this is a fantasy. You're going on television to talk about this book, which is a bestseller. That's a fantasy. You keep saying, wow, what? I would have given anything for that 10 mm. years ago. Because when you have a brilliant brain, which we all have, you always have a choice. Talk yourself into it or talk yourself out. And she was talking yourself out of it. I've got to go on television. Cameras are going to be on me. What if I don't know what to say? I'm going to say, wow, this is amazing. Someone wants me to go on TV and talk about a book and people are going to buy it because I'm on TV and I'm holding the book. Why is it that we become kind of desensitized to our blessings or, you know, the fear bubbles up and like we, we keep kind of elevating and expanding levels of success in our life and then we get to this place where it's not enough or we we can't remember where we've been yeah. and so we start complaining about this and like, you know, it's people look at our life, you know, and they're, and they're saying, <coughs> oh my mm. gosh, if only I could be there, if only I had yeah. that and we're like, oh, if only we could have this. Mm. Like how, why is it that we 
Do you know, we, we think we're Forget. so modern, but we're still tribal people. And, you know, in a tri- when I was in Australia, for instance, when you wake up, you shake out your shoes looking for a poison before you put them on. When you walk to the pool, you have to bang your feet so all the snakes go away. And, you know, when I was in Costa Rica, the same thing. You're always looking for poison things before you get into bed. You, I remember going into the bathroom. There was a scorpion in there. I was like, oh, my God. I learned then not to go in there without shoes on and to always put the light on. So... Many years ago, being negative saved us. When I was in Africa, as you walk around, you're always looking for lion droppings because then you know, is there a lion and are they fresh? Because if they are, I better not go that way. <laughs> so the negative kept you alive, you know. And it's so interesting how women always went to the bathroom in tribes in a group. You know, let's all go together because there might be some weirdo, there might be a snake, there might be an ant, let's go together. And we still to that day when we're out go, hey, do you want to come with me? <laughs> no one says, hey, I'm at home with my mum, let's go to the bathroom together. I never say to my sister, come to the bathroom with me. But when I'm out, we go together. Because it's wired into our brain that that makes women safe. No men do that. And when I'm home, I pee with the door open. Yeah, of course. It's of like, course. <laughs> I'm like, where did this come from? But yeah. I think it's true. Yeah. The need to be safe. And, you know, even the way we shop, like, you know, a man will, I say, if I said to my husband, can you get some oranges? He comes up, didn't you get anything else? You said oranges. <laughs> so if you imagine a guy, he's got the bow and arrow, the wild beast, they just get the first one. They can't wait for the best one because that could have been the first one. They just get the wild beast and go home. But women were the gatherers. So they go and look at all the different crops. They couldn't, and they go back to the best one. Take it. So if I said I want a coat, I go, I want a coat. I'm going to look at every coat on mm. Abbott Kinney. My husband's like, get that. No, no, I like that one. But I'm going to look at all the others mm-hmm. now. Then I know I've got the right one. He doesn't understand. He goes, I want a coat. I like that coat. Done. Got the coat. So the way we shop, even the way we go to the bathroom, is so wired into our evolution. And, you know, being negative once kept you alive. You looked for danger. It's like saying, why do I put a seatbelt on? Why do I lock the... Why do I put an alarm on at night? Isn't that negative? Not really. It's just a protection. But evolution, for evolutionary terms, being negative, like going, I'm not going to eat those berries. They might be poisonous. Mm. And, you know, even children at two, they won't eat what they don't know. They go, I don't want that. It's got lumps in it. I only like pink yogurt, and that one's yellow. Because they learn to only eat what they knew and that's why they never got poisoned they wouldn't try any new stuff so our body is so brilliant at keeping us alive and of course our greatest fear was to be rejected if you were rejected in a tribe that that was it if you were banished cast out marooned you were as good as death yeah because you're out and in the- romeo and juliet when they banished him he said i'd rather be killed hmm. there's nothing out there but purgatory so we still have this feeling if you reject me it will kill me it can be the best thing that ever happened to you mm. but we have to go back and go oh it would have killed me and now it feels like it's going to kill me but the truth is you can't reject me. only I can reject me you can mm. say something horrible you cannot reject me unless I give you my permission I'm never going to do that yes I love someone says to me rejection is God's protection and redirection yeah yeah, and doing that little reading, I would say a delay is not a denial. It's a delay. So just having little reframes, you know. So is, is hypnotherapy, you know, the, the deepest, most rapid way to, to oh, transform? Absolutely. The fastest way by far, you know, because it goes, we'll do it in a minute, it goes straight to the cause of something yeah. instantly. You know, the word cure comes from the word curious, mm. which I love. So when you're curious, you go, oh, well, when did I learn to have um, an inability to drive in tunnels? When did I start getting this anxious stomach? Clearly, I wasn't born with it. So hypnosis is, let's go and have a look at what happened because within curious is the, is the cure. cure. I mean, you're not allowed to say cure, but you say someone said, I bite my nails. And then we go back, well, you know, no baby can do that. Babies don't have any teeth. You can't possibly be born biting your nails because you need that real coordination, mm. which you don't have until you're probably at least 18 months. So you must have learned it. Oh, I learned when I was five, I was anxious, and I started to do that, and that kind of calmed me down. And then you can say, well, we can cure that, but you've got to be very careful using the word cure for illnesses. But when you get curious... You will find a cure for your disease thinking, your disease beliefs, and then 
once you've got the information, because a lot of people say, you know, I don't know why I drink. I don't know why I self. I have no idea why I keep screaming at my kids. So when you have the, oh, I did it because of that. That's interesting. It's not quite enough. It's almost enough. The first thing is to get the information. The second is to then change the information. The third is to wire in a brand new belief. And if someone, say someone has like a history of, I'm just thinking of a friend, um, alcohol abuse, you know, as an escape, and he's very high functioning in, in society, successful at what he does, and no one would really know the extent of this problem, but I know. Um, and like, could it happen in one session? Would it take oh, yeah. multiple sessions? No. You know, one session, you should have maybe two. I mean, all our people we train, we say do two or three for simple things, including that. But for some complex things more. So if you came in, I can't pass my driving test. I can't merge on the freeway. I bite my nose, I pull out my eyelashes. That could mm. all be done in a session. But if someone said, you know, I've got an eating disorder, I suffer with panic attacks, we'd say, look, let's do three. Okay. But we can work with you now and do one and get rid of the headaches. Okay, completely. great. Yes, thank you. So should we do that right now? We've got a whole host of issues. So should we do <laughs> Oh, yes, because before we do that, you, you mentioned people pleasing. So just tell me a little bit about that before we begin. Yeah, people pleasing and then perfectionism. I've, I think I've come a long way um, mm -hmm. just through personal development work and different therapies. Um, but I still notice that there is an efforting there's a lot of stress and, and overthinking coming from sending an email or or having you know saying no to someone just saying no because i'm not resourced or i'm afraid i have the irrational fear that if i say no to honor myself and my needs that i will miss the opportunity i will lose a friend i will not be whatever that is like missing yeah. opportunities and not mm. be successful like i almost feel like i've got to say yes to everything or you know but that crazy as it says so i want you to say that again i want you to say i've got to say yes to everything because and then just or it's like chinese whispers just automatically end that says say i've got to say everything because and, and finish the sentence i got to say yes to everything because do that now and say what i really yeah, feel whatever comes whatever into comes. your head i've got to say yes to everything because if i don't I will fail at life. Interesting. And I know I'll fail at life because, just do it again. And I know I'll fail at life because I might miss that one opportunity that breaks me out of mm. where I'm at. Yeah. <laughs> See, because <laughs> is the most influential word in the English language. And when you start to say, I do that because, or I'm scared of missing out because, or I say yes to everything because, or I get headaches every weekend because it's, and when you say, I don't know why I get headaches, it's a closer. When you go, I get headaches because I'm a people pleaser, and I'm a people pleaser because I don't want to miss out, and I don't want to miss out because, well, I missed out once where I've got a belief that, you mm. know, I haven't quite got there yet, and there's always the bigger, better deal. Then you go, but, but is that really true? You know, I don't have, I have Domo. I have the delight of missing out. I have Joe, <laughs> the absolute joy. You know, last year I got invited to the red carpet event at the Super Bowl and I was somewhere else. I thought, I don't really want to go. I just want to go home and lie on the table with my cats. And I would say, I've got Domo and Jomo. Yeah. So sometimes you have to think, you know, if it's meant for you, it's not going to go past you. Are you really going to miss out if you don't go everywhere? Because going everywhere is the stress. I've got to go there because it might be there. It might be there. It might be there. But, you know, you're a successful woman. You've yeah. created an amazing document. You've written an incredible But You can't miss out because you've already Thank won. You. you can't you. lose when you've already won. Yeah, you get fixated <clears throat> on these, like, you whether it's a group. I get fixated yeah. or, yeah. Um, you know, on, on people or opportunities or mm. this show or that whatever it is that we are yeah. attaching our value or success if and when. Yeah. So here's something that will help you. I want you to start saying, what I am moving towards is always moving towards me. What I want wants me. And as I, it's moving towards me, all, I don't have to go out and find it. I mean, mm. sure, if you want love, you should go out. You can't sit at home on the couch because <laughs> you want to fall in love with the Amazon delivery person. <laughs> yeah, so I'll there know. is a thing about, you know, there's a three-step process, which is, okay, I want something. I require something. And the first step is to go, I deserve it. Let's say it was love or success. The first step is the easiest. It's one that people just don't do. It is to sit back and go, 
I am worthy of love. I'm deserving of love. I'm worthy of success. I deserve it. And you might think, I feel really silly when I say that. Well, then keep doing it until you don't. I'm going to say, I feel angry. I feel pissed off when you say I'm worthy of love because I'm not. Hmm. Well, that's the sign. Keep doing it. <clears throat> it's so unfamiliar. You've got to make it familiar. Hmm. Keep doing it. And when it's become, oh, yeah, I am worthy of love. Who couldn't love me? Aren't I a lovable person? I've got something to share with someone amazing. My grand say every pan has a lid. So I'm someone's lid. Aww, someone is my pan. I love that. So the first, that's the first step. And don't shortcut that. In the shower, which is a very meditative state, just keep saying, I'm worthy of health or joy or peace or love or wealth. Say it. Keep saying it until it's familiar because mm. the human mind wants to go back to what is familiar. That's a fact. But here's another one. You can make anything like, you can make putting a bit of silicone in your eye familiar if you do it every day. <laughs> when you've done step one, here we go to step two. Take a long, hard look at what you want. Like, for instance, you wanted to write a book, but you actually wanted to write a best-selling book that helped people. It wasn't just a book. It's like, oh, if I look at that, I want to write a bestseller that helps people. So now you begin to say, well, what, I've got to do a lot of research. And then you see the third step, which is when you can see what you want in step two. I want love, I want success, I want health. Step three is go out and get it. And what does that mean? Well, it might mean go and talk to publishers, go on television, go and show your work to someone. And you can only do step three if you've done step one, which is I'm worth it. Mm. So now I can take my paintings to a gallery. I can take myself to things. I'm going to meet someone amazing here because I'm lovable. Mm. I can say, hey, this book is amazing. You've got to publish it because I've done step one. Mm -hmm. I've done step two. Look to what I really want and see, oh, whatever I require requires me to do something new. And then step three is do it. I love it. And most people don't do that. They just do step two. I, I want that. And mm -hmm. and they wonder why it doesn't happen. You want love. People say to me, I'm looking for love. Where are you looking? What do you mean? <laughs> where are you looking? Oh, where do you... I go to yoga with my girlfriends. Any men there? No. That's not looking for love. Go to the weight room. That's where the men are. <laughs> and if you're a guy, go to the yoga room because that's where the women are. And then I go to a bar with all my friends. If you were really looking for love, you'd say, I'm worthy of love. What kind of person do I want? I want a sporty person, animal lover. Well, now you know that you should go and walk people's dogs. You know, one of my clients was devastated when her marriage ended, but she loved animals. And she ended up working in a sanctuary for rescued foxes and hedgehogs oh. and birds. I met a guy there and they're blissfully happy. Yeah. Because of course, you know what, she wanted someone like her that loves animals. Well, they're not in a bar, but they <laughs> are somewhere else, you know, Go and work out if you want someone sporty. Do some running. Join Friends of the Earth or Greenpeace. But people say, I'm just, I'm just looking for love, but they're not. Mm, so you've yeah. got to be very solution oriented. That worthy piece is so huge. The you is cannot everything. line up with what you, and that's where people get stuck, I think. Yeah. It's like that 80 underlying percent belief. of your success in anything, having a business, having wealth comes into having this I'm worth it mm. mindset, 80%, which is why I wear these bracelets to say I'm enough, and mm. I created the I'm enough movement, because if you can crack that, you know, addicts never think they're enough, it's why they need more. Mm. I need more drink, more drugs, mm. more, more porn, because I'm not enough. So the common denominator of all of our issues is I'm not worthy enough, beautiful enough, interesting enough, qualified enough. Mm -hmm. There's so many ways to think you're not enough. None of them are true. But if you understand that that is the basis of most of our issues, I'm not enough, so I need more, more followers, more screen time. Mm -hmm. But if I am enough, I'm not gonna sit on the couch and eat Pringles. I'm gonna, okay, I can go out now. Mm -hmm. and follow my goals because I'm worth it. Mm -hmm. So the first step is the easiest, it's the simplest, it doesn't require any money or time. Just say it when you're in the shower every day because it will change your entire life. And tell me that saying again, what you are, what, I mean, what you are seeking, seeking you is yeah. the Rumi quote. But what, what you want wants you. What you are moving towards is already moving towards you. So if you believe you're worthy of love and you do that, I'm worthy, I'm worthy, I'm worthy, as you move to it, it's already moving towards you because yeah. you believe, who couldn't love me? Like, haven't I got something to offer the world? 
Every you know, pan I, I, has its lid. Yeah, every pan has a lid. And you know, love is all around you. It's at the bus stop, it's at the tube station, it's in the grocery store. You know, I met my husband at our children's school. It's everywhere. You don't, you, certainly you can go to a bar, but if you believe love is all around mm -hmm. me, then it is, and it'll find you just as much as you find it when you know you're worth it. Yes. And the same thing with success. People will call you and go, hey, Kelly, come on this show. Let's have a busy... You don't have to go look for it, because when you know you're worth it and you have the energy, people will pick that up. Yeah, and timelines collapse. Like, there's of no... Course. It's It's just like you said about the you know, conditioned beliefs we have about this, that, and the other thing, and which is why, you know, even chemotherapy, we just associate it with nausea, loss of, of hair, you know, so, yeah. and I know people that have done belief work around that, and they don't have those symptoms. Yeah, because the placebo effect, and also the no the expectation, effect. Expectation, yeah. What you expect is going to happen. So expect something better, you'll probably find it. Yeah, and and quickly. My mm. friend is like, I can't, I'm 44 years old. I'm never going to have a child because it's going to, you know, I, I don't know, I've, I haven't met the guy. And then when I meet the guy, it's going to be a year before we get married. And then it's going to be another, you know, so there's this, this like and conditioned timeline. Stress. I'm like, no, it yeah. could happen. You could meet him a week later, elope and fall in love and like get pregnant yeah. on the first night, you know? You yeah, just... I got married 10 months after I met my husband. If it, was, it would have been 10 weeks if it was down to him. Yeah. I met him, we already knew each other and we were married 10 months later, yeah. so. So seek just, out yeah. those those examples that you wanna grasp onto. Just change your whole belief system. You know, if, if you had a ladder, it goes like this. First you have a thought, thoughts always come first. The first is a thought, a thought creates feelings and feelings create behavior. So let's imagine the thought, I'm 44, the clock is ticking, I'm never gonna have a baby. Now the feeling is, oh my God, I'm in a complete panic, I'm so nervous. And what's the behavior? Well, I feel anxious, I feel pissed off, I feel depressed, I feel blocked, I feel stuck, I feel everything's against Not me. Not worthy. Because we've gone now gone back to this loop. Mm -hmm. I'm 44 years old, too late to have a baby. But you could say I'm 44, I'm super fertile. I'm gonna meet someone and we're gonna fall in love in a heartbeat and get, have a baby together. I can meet someone who's already got children. It doesn't matter, change the belief. Mm -hmm. And then when you change the belief, you, the feelings come after the thoughts and the behaviors come out. And we're, we're so busy saying, I'm gonna change the behavior and the feeling, but here's the law. Thoughts come first. Thoughts dictate your feelings, feelings dictate your behavior. And you justify it by going back to the thought. So the thing you've got to change is the thought. Mm. If you change the thought, it changes everything. And by the way, 44, you don't, women, we don't really know who we are before That's our right. early 40s or 40 years old. So it's like now we're clear on what we want, we're clear yeah. on what we don't want. And yeah. you know, it's like that honing in process is a lot faster. There's a woman called Elizabeth Barrett Brown. She was a very famous um, writer in England. She got pregnant at 48 with tuberculosis. Oh. And she was more than equivalent of someone of 68 because that was well over 150 years ago. Wow. Anyway, let's work on you before we run okay. out of time. Okay. So let's just talk about the headaches. Okay. The stress headaches. What happens just before they arrive? Oh, Lord. Um, I always associate it with them with uh, dehydration. So mm -hmm. usually it's a long, it's either traveling or a f like a week of busyness mm -hmm. and not getting proper rest and then going out later mm. maybe there's alcohol involved but again not excessive like i wasn't hung over the next day mm. but there's just this like and if you know it's like dehydration this. are you then working to always hydrate to stop it or do you just forget i am i am so I'm, even though you hydrate I still you still that. believe you get dehydration <laughs> yeah, headaches so how much water do you drink a day Oh gosh, I don't know, but I drink a lot. So then how can you get dehydration headaches if you hydrate so much? I don't much? know, maybe I didn't take the minerals. I'm not sure, that's a good okay. question. Well, let's find out. So hypnosis is lovely, it, you don't go to sleep. Actually, it doesn't seem to be, it wakes you up to your potential, you really like it, it's not scary. You can't relive a single, if you went back to a time when, say your brother pulled your hair, you don't think, oh my brother's, but you go, oh, in that scene, he pulled my hair. That wasn't very nice. You can't relive it. You can only review. Mm. So you're not going back to any, even trauma. You've already, if you went back to being in a car crash, you're not reliving it because you're reviewing. It's like watching a movie. And if you're going to look at this with fascination, mm. because the curiosity is going to give me the cure, then you can look at anything and go, yeah, that was awful, but I'm just reviewing it now. 
So first of all, you can't relive it. Okay. Secondly, whatever you see, you've already dealt with it. So let's just stop you having headaches forever because you don't need them, especially since you do hydrate and you do sleep. I, I take it you sleep okay. I sleep pretty well. Yeah. I sleep with my four-year-old. That's yeah. the only. But, but that's a lovely thing. Yeah, it is a lovely thing. How many hours sleep do you get a night? I mean, last night I got, you know, almost seven and a half. That's good. Yeah. Good. So that varies from six yeah. to eight. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And you see, of course, your four-year-old just sleeps, doesn't she? She has oh, no issue. No issue. And doesn't think about hydration at all, I imagine. No, she doesn't. Yeah, and doesn't get headaches. And doesn't get headaches. No. Okay, so make yourself comfortable. Okay. The trick with hypnosis, this is a trick, just keep your eyes open for a minute, okay. Kelly, is that you you got to do this to get, there's many ways, but this is the way that's super effective. You have to look up like that, as if you're trying to look at your eyebrows. Keep your eyeballs up, but shut the lids, because in that you're going to what's called an alpha brainwave. You know when you go to sleep, you roll your eyes up. When you, yes. You know your kids going to sleep when they go like that, oh, Go to sleep, yay. Yeah. So look up for okay. me as high as you can. Keep your eye, and just shut the lids down. And you see you've got REM, and means that you've gone into rapid eye movement, which means you're a great subject. Mm. So you can open your eyes now. Anyone who's creative is powerfully suggestible. You can't write a book, produce a documentary, decorate a home, or put an outfit together if you're not creative. Some people say, oh, I, I can't see that. I'm, but the creative people are suggestible and it's their greatest gift and their greatest downfall because they give themselves the wrong suggestions. Mm. So, you're a suggestible person. We're gonna make that a gift, only a gift, always a gift. That's gonna be your greatest asset because you need to say things like, if I'm dehydrated, one glass of water will fix that. You know, I've had eight hours sleep. Um, I can deal with stress. You know, stress is around me, it just goes over my head. I've got amazing coping skills. You've got to deflect the belief because Remember, the thought creates the feeling, the feeling creates the headache. Mm. You have these beliefs that you get a headache when, and remember your mind's job is to make that real. But if you give your mind a different belief, I can cope with stress, have a great night's sleep, and it's all fantastic. You know, if you look at a lion, you know, or, or hunting a gazelle, it just relaxes. If you go and see tribes, they have a stressful life, but they sleep a lot. We, we we believe that life is stressful. It's not the stress, it's your choice to how you react to it. Mm. So, okay. look up as high as you can. Keep your eyeballs up. Take a deep breath, breathe in, breathe out. Take another deep breath. Every time you blink, deep, powerful healing hypnosis is coming upon you. And just one more time. Breathe in, hold it. The more you blink, the deeper, faster you're going into powerful, profound healing hypnosis. As you exhale, close your eyelids right down. Just forget all about your eyes. You can already see that you have REM, rapid eye movement. You only get that when you're dreaming or going into hypnosis and showing me that you're a great subject. Forget about your eyes, drop your chin. And I want you to imagine you're looking down 10 steps. And in fact, by dropping your chin, you already have that looking down feeling that you get as you look down a flight of stairs or over a balcony. As I count, you're going to feel your feet, see your feet, hear your feet taking 10 steps right now. You're moving on to step 10, going deeper into an awareness of yourself. You're taking step nine, going deeper into your own internal state. You're taking step eight and seven and you can see your feet, hear your feet, feel your feet treading each step as you move down, drift down, travel down to a deep healing level. You're taking step five, you're halfway down, you're now going deeper, Kelly, with every sound you hear. As you take step four, the sound of your breathing is taking you deeper. As you take step three, the sound of your heartbeat is taking you deeper. As you take step two, you're going deeper, deeper, deeper. You're taking step one, just go deeper, deeper, deeper. And as you go deeper, you know you're already powerfully suggestible. You already are a creative person. And you're ready to let every suggestion into let every suggestion work. So here's a suggestion. When you were a baby, when you were Riley's age, you didn't know what a headache was. You had no idea what a stress headache was. You went to school, you took exams, you fell out with your friends. 
things happen, but you didn't ever have stress headaches. So we're gonna go back right now to why, where, how, and when you got these stress headaches, and then we're gonna just let go of them forever. Your brilliant mind knows exactly why you get these stress headaches, and it knows how you can move away from that for the rest of your life on the count of five. Your brilliant mind is taking you right back right now to a vivid, vital, crucial, powerful scene that is the cause. The reason the root of these stress headaches on the count of four, you're becoming years younger. On the count of three and two years, months, weeks, days are peeling away from your body as you go right back to the origin, the reason, the root of these headaches, just be there. As I click my fingers, it's rather like you switched on a television set. A picture's warming up on the screen. You are right in the middle of it. And you'll effortlessly answer every question. This scene, Kelly, where you are right now, is it daytime or nighttime? Ugh, um, daytime. And are you inside or outside? Outside. How old are you about? Um, I think like seven, eight. And it, it's okay to feel tearful and emotional. I'm a great believer that where tears go, healing begins. So don't stop that. When you say I'm seven years old, I'm outside and I'm feeling. Just relay what's going on. I want you to see what you saw. Feel what, and as I click my fingers, your ears are opening. Here it comes, one, two, three. You can even hear exactly what you heard outside that little girl. Uh, this is, I did not expect to go here. Um, we're setting up a tent in mm -hmm. Anza Borrego, <laughs> California. Mm -hmm. And my dad is getting really upset and screaming and really embarrassing me in front of a lot of people. Because, let me say, my dad's getting upset because... Because I'm not helping him mm -hmm. or I'm doing it wrong. So you, are you setting up the tent or your dad setting up the tent or the family setting We're up the tent? We're all supposed to be setting you're up supposed to, And your dad's screaming at you. I'm going to click my fingers. You can hear exactly what he says. Here it comes. What's he saying to you? Oh, um, he's saying like cursing, like, God damn it. You Go know. on. I don't know. Your um, dad's a good person. He is. I have a bad friend. You know, people have bad days, but um, the little girl of seven, yeah. I want you to feel, what, as your dad curses, it's supposed to be a lovely family event, I want you to feel exactly what you're feeling. And what is that little girl feeling? She's feeling, I'm angry that my dad's not nicer. Yeah. Go on. And I'm embarrassed that he's acting like this in mm -hmm. front of other families and our friends mm -hmm. and I'm pissed off that I have to that I'm embarrassed mm -hmm. and he's not nicer and more patient and um, I just want to be a kid and go play yeah I want you to stay in that scene. I want you to imagine you have x-ray glasses and you can look over and around and through that scene because in that scene there's a little girl who has is powerless it's what's called learned helplessness Learned hope says, I can't fix this. My dad is really angry. I'm just seven. He expects perfection. I don't know how to put up a tent. He expects me to help, but I don't know what to do. I want you to really feel that imprint, because when you have a scared child, an authority figure, so it's called an imprint. In goes a belief. I just can't get things right. And it makes people angry. Then I get pissed off, but also sad. What else is going on in that scene? You're doing fantastically well, by the way, but what else is going on? Um, I'm just like rebelling, mm -hmm. and my mom is getting mad at him. How and are I you just rebelling? Want to run away. What are you doing to rebel? Um, I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. I think I just walk away, like yeah. pissed off, mm -hmm. and like f afraid that I'm going to get punished later. Yeah. I want you to say one more thing. I'm pissed off because, just start and finish that sentence. I'm pissed off because my dad is impatient mm -hmm. and is an asshole. Mm -hmm. And I'm also pissed off that I have to do so many things in mm -hmm. such a stressful environment when I just want to go play and of be course. a kid. Yeah. Let that scene go. We're gonna go back to two more, just to really look at how you learn to get these stress headaches in reaction to 
really expectations. So now you're going to another scene, an even more vivid, vital, crucial scene that is all to do with the cause, the reason, the root of these headaches. Again, you are becoming younger, smaller, lighter, shorter, years are peeling away from your body. You're drifting right back right now to a vivid, vital scene that is the cause, the reason, the root of these headaches, not trying at all, just be there immediately. Another scene is filling up your mind. Like you switch on a computer, it's warming up, and there you are right in the middle of the screen. This scene, Kelly, where you are now, is it daytime or nighttime? Oh, um, I don't know. I want you yeah, to. I'm getting analytical. Say that again. No, I'm like in my head. Okay, okay it doesn't matter. I want you to stay in the scene. I want you to see what you saw, feel what you felt, hear what you heard. So you're going back to a scene that again is all to do with how you learned to get stress, headaches. Your mind knows why. It's giving you that. If it's already found the scene, it's just pushing it into your head right now. As I click my fingers, that scene is filling up your mind and you know immediately, is it daytime, nighttime, inside, outside, how old you are? Mm. The only question that matters is this one. What are you doing, seeing, feeling, and experiencing? So in this scene, how old are you about? Oh. Roughly. Um, it's all like jumbled. That's I okay. Is it daytime or nighttime? I think night. Mm -hmm. And I want you to stay in that scene. As I click my fingers, you can feel exactly what you felt like it was yesterday you can hear exactly what you heard as i click my fingers your ears are open you can hear something being said to you over you about you you can see what you saw hear what you heard feel what you felt tell me what's going on in this scene um i mean the only scene that i can keep coming back to is i'm in my bed but mm -hmm. i don't know how old i am mm -hmm. it I doesn't matter you're in your bed what are you feeling and I just hear my parents yelling at mm -hmm. each other and i want you to tell me i want you to say when i hear i'm in bed i hear my parents yelling say that i'm in bed and i hear my parents and yelling. that makes me feel and that makes me feel scared and sad because because i just want peace mm. You want peace. And yeah, I just want peace. And again, you can't do anything to stop them yelling, can you? You can't go downstairs and say, hey, knock it off. Or by the way, this is really inappropriate. Or, I'm a little girl and this is upsetting me. There's nothing you can do, is there? Mm -mm. So you have that helplessness and hopelessness again. They're shouting. How often does that happen when you're a little girl? Um, a lot. A I mean, lot. Yes and no. My dad was a pilot, so he's mm -hmm. gone half the month. But more than once every three months. Yeah. So pretty, pretty frequently. This is like a big one. They don't usually argue like this in front of me. I would say this is a big one because... <sighs> I don't know. I think just my mom was yelling back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she was just sticking up for us. Mm. For, and like no, not to get for her, for us. So she was sticking up for all of you. Yeah, from my brother and I. Mm -hmm. Why did she need to stick up for you? What is it that made your mother need to stick up for you in this scene? Um, I think just because he's so hard on everybody. Mm. So he has impossible expectations. Mm -hmm. Of himself and then therefore us. Yeah, and that's really hard to live with, isn't it? Impossible expectations. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a parent with impossible expectations, what you feel is I'm always going to fail. I can't reach these expectations, so you feel like you're always going to fail. Yeah. And again, you can't get out of bed and stop this. So let's just go back to one more scene. This scene is going to be the most powerful, the most revealing, the most profound. So put those other two to one side. We will come back to them. I'm doing this quite quickly because I'm aware of time, but this takes minutes. And remember, it's not what happened that's affected you, it's how you feel about it. So one more time on the count of five, you're going back to a vivid, vital, crucial, powerful, significant scene that is the cause, the reason, the root of these headaches. You are becoming younger, smaller, lighter, shorter, years, months, weeks, days are 
peeling away from your body, you are drifting right back right now to a vivid, vital, crucial, powerful scene that is the cause, the reason, the root of these headaches. Just be there. A vivid scene is filling up your mind and you know immediately the answer to these questions. This scene that is filling up your mind that you're right in the middle of. Is it daytime or nighttime? Daytime. Inside or outside? Inside. How old are you about? I think I'm like six. And I want you to describe what it is that you're doing, seeing, feeling, see like what four, you saw. It doesn't matter. Yeah. You're a little girl. That's all we need to know. I what see is... my mom and dad. My dad's already at the door. My mom is leaving and mm -hmm. saying goodbye. And they're going away for a week for the first time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're leaving me with our au pair. Mm -hmm. Or us, my brother and I. Yeah. And I'm just like, I think they're going to die. I think I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. I want you to say, I'm a little girl. I'm a little girl. I'm a little girl. And when I see my parents leaving us for the first time. And when I see my parents leaving us for the first time. I think they're going to die because. I think they're going to die because they're going somewhere far and not in my sight. <laughs> and that makes me feel. And that makes me feel terrified. Yeah. I want you to feel the feeling. Terrified, anxious, what else? Anxious, alone, helpless, scared. And uh, are you telling them how you feel? No, I'm just screaming and crying, <clears throat> telling them, don't go. And as you scream and cry and say, don't go, don't go, what do they say? Um, I mean, my dad just goes to the car. <laughs> my You're, mom is like... Dad, say that again, your dad... My dad just... I, I don't see him, so I think he's mm -hmm. out in the car just waiting. You, and your mom? And my mom's just trying to convince me, like, honey, it'll be okay. We're just going for a week. We'll be back. Mm -hmm. I love you. I love you so much. You can, you're going to have fun. You know, just trying to convince me that all is okay. And then I'm sure it was breaking her heart, too, mm -hmm. but she finally left. And you were still... Were you still crying when she left? Yeah. Okay. Probably for hours. <laughs> I want you to imagine, Kelly, you've got three scenes in your left hand. I want you to imagine you're holding in your left hand three pictures. The last one of the little girl who's so scared when her parents are leaving and thinks they might never come back. And what will you do? Because you're a dependent child. You can't look after yourself. So that's really scary. They've gone. They're not taking you. You don't know where they're going to be. And then the middle scene where you're lying in bed and your mum is screaming, trying to dig up you and your brother and you can't do anything. In the first scene where your dad is losing it over the tent and you're both upset, but also angry that he expects so much of you. And I want you to imagine in this hand, you're holding a picture of your day with headaches. So here's a photograph of you or video of you with headaches. And your mind is saying, Kelly, these three scenes are the cause of this scene. There's many other scenes, but your mind didn't pick these three at random. It didn't say, oh, let's just have a go. It said these scenes without a question of the cause of the headache. So I can tell you because it's my job, but you are a creative person. Tell me how those three scenes and others like them cause the headache. And also tell me, if you looked at those three scenes, what one word or phrase would link the scenes together? What was the common denominator of each of those scenes? The little girl with a tent, Little girl in bed listening to the fighting, the little girl crying because they're leaving without her. I think it's anger and helplessness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's okay. And how has anger and helplessness left you with these headaches that last for three days? Um, just probably when I feel helpless. Yeah. I want to say when I'm not expressing I, anger. Yeah. I want to say when I feel helpless. When I feel helpless. My body reacts like I'm still a child. My body reacts like I'm still a child. I still feel helpless and hopeless and powerless. I still feel helpless, hopeless, and powerless. And then I get a headache. And I get a headache. And then I'm even more helpless, and hopeless, and powerless. And then I'm even powerless. more helpless, hopeless, and powerless. Yeah. So I'm going to do something that might seem really weird, but it's actually amazing. I want you to imagine you can go inside and find the part of you that created the headaches. Whenever you have something you don't like, oh my God, here's the headache again. Here's the stomach again. Here's the irritable bowel again. Your mind thinks, you know, this is actually very useful. If it doesn't go away and keeps coming back, if I do things, not only do you want it, you need it. And it has a role, a function, a purpose. I want you to go, I'm the part of Kelly that came up with the headaches. Just say it. 
I'm the part of Kelly that came up with the headaches. Now I have a voice I can tell you. Now that I have a voice I can tell you. The role of the headaches for Kelly is always to. The role of the headaches for Kelly is always to. Finish that as fast as you can. Protect her. From. From. Go on. <laughs> and when you say the headaches are protecting her from. The headaches are protecting her from saying how she really feels. Yeah, and if she said how she really feels, what would she say? And if she said how she really feels, she would say how she really feels. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go don't, there. Yeah. I'm sick of trying to make everyone happy. I'm sick of trying to make everybody happy. That's what I had to do with my dad yeah. all my whole life. That's what I had to do with my dad my whole life. I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. But then the other part says, well, I've got to be a good girl because that upset him too. So I've got to be good. I've got to please everyone. And in pleasing everyone, the person you don't please is yourself. Mm. Isn't that true? Yes. So the headaches mask how you really feel. Yeah. You're in kind of pain and then you get this real pain, but then you can't say what you feel. Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this two more times. It's like a game, but it's a game that you can never get wrong. I want you to say, I'm the headaches. I'm the headaches. And now I have a voice I can tell you. And now I have a voice I can tell you. The job of the headaches for Kelly is only to. The job of the headaches for Kelly is only to protect her from saying how she really feels and honoring herself and mm-hmm. pissing a lot of people off. Mm-hmm. And if Kelly said how she really felt and pissed people off, then what would happen? If Kelly said how she really feels and pissed people off, she would be alone and everybody would hate her. Okay. Let's do this one more time. You're right on the money here. I want you to say, I'm the headaches. I'm the headaches. And my purpose in Kelly's life is always to... And my purpose in Kelly's life is always to protect her from from saying and doing what she really wants to say and do Mm. how old was kelly when you came into her life how old was she when these headaches turned up to protect her oh gosh i don't remember but they're more frequent recently Mm. I want you to ask part a funny question. How old does the part think you are now? The part, how old does it believe you are, the part that's giving you these headaches? It thinks you are how old? The part, oh, 18. And how old are you? 44. (laughs) So it thinks you're 18, you're actually 44. Mm -hmm. So you see, here's something interesting. Everything that's going on is always going to be begin with a P. It's to protect you, punish you, or prioritize you. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what illness you have in the whole world, it's, apart from what, when it's created by a disease of the thinking, it's going to be to protect you, punish you, prioritize yeah. you, get you. And, and you pick the protection. But now I see maybe prioritize me. Well, that's okay. I have an you excuse can, You can have all three. Me. I want you to go back to the part. You can do this in your head, right? I want you to say, thanks for coming into my life. <sighs> thanks for coming. And trying to mask my feelings. I'm trying to mask my feelings. But I don't want to mask my feelings. But I don't want to mask my feelings. I want to say how I feel. I want to say how I feel. And I'm going to say how I feel. But I'm going to say And I'm going to say no. And I'm going to say no. Because until I say no, yes has no meaning. Because until I say no, yes has no meaning. And I'm going to stop apologizing. And I'm going to stop apologizing. Instead of saying, I'm so sorry, I can't. I'm going to say, thanks for asking me, but I'm busy. Instead of saying, I'm so sorry, I can't. I... Thanks Thank for asking me, but I'm busy. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I'm, late. I'm going to say, thank you for waiting. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, um, I'm I late. Say, I'm thanks. late. Thank you for waiting. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I can't. Say, thanks for helping me out here. Instead of saying, I'm sorry, I can't. I can't understand. I IT. can't I'm understand. going to say, thanks for helping thanks me. Thanks for helping me. Because you're not sorry. You're sorry you didn't have a voice. You know, I watched an interview with Helen Mirren. They said, what do you regret? She said, I regret I didn't say fuck off. Oh, earlier that. and more often that's my only regret I wish I'd said fuck off more yes Helen. and that's a great word because it's a maximizer it's a minimizer it can be a very powerful word and no kid can say that well some kids do actually but no <laughs> so everybody says to their dad fuck off with a tent stop arguing with my mother so you need to take your power back you're not seven you're not six you're not five your parents were lovely but they were flawed 
Here's the thing, Kelly, you are a flawed person and you're going to spend your whole life having flawed relations with the flawed people. It's called being flawsome. Mm-hmm. Being flawsome is wonderful because you're allowed to fail. Being perfect is a curse. Perfect people are the unhappiest people in the world and the loneliest because when you join the race to be perfect, as you get to the finish line, it moves and it moves. There's no terminal called perfect. There's no destination called perfect. The destination is let's be flawsome together. What a relief. I can say, thanks for inviting me, but I'm actually going to stay home tonight. Mm. Thanks for giving me that. I'm, I'm going to pass. Thank you for, but no, tonight I'm just going to stay. Like Sheena Reeson said on that, I'm, I'm going to stay home and watch my TV. <laughs> I'm going to take a bath and go to bed. I'm going to have Jomo and Domo, and I'm going to go, fuck no, a lot. Because Every time you have the headaches, you're like a little girl who has no power. Mm. You keep getting pulled back into that little girl who couldn't say to her dad, you're being so unreasonable here. I'm seven years old. I don't even know what you expect of me, but a child can't say that. You're unreasonable, you're unrealistic. You can only say I'm upset or I'm angry. And you see, you had anger and upset and you get these thumping migraines. This, you know what they are? You, they're anger. Mm. The voice who wants to go, fuck you. So imagine someone says to you now, Kelly, I've got something to do, and you go, fuck no. Say it now. <laughs> fuck no. Never. Never. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. It doesn't suit me. It doesn't suit that me. It doesn't work for me. It doesn't work I'm for not me. available. I'm not available. I'm choosing to say no. I'm choosing to say I'm no. I'm choosing to say fuck no. I'm choosing to say fuck no. <laughs> and in that, I never have to have a headache ever again. And in that, I never have to have a headache again. You see, the pain is interesting because there's always a hurt behind anger and the trick with anger is to do the hurt that little girl of seven was angry when she ordered from the tent but she was hurt Mm. and when you're hurt the body says let me get a screaming headache a thumping pain when you said it wraps around my eyebrow it grabs my jaw that's pain and your body wants you to go fuck that Mm. and then there won't be any pain so I want you to say to the headache, thanks for all the information. Thank you for all the information. If I say no. If I say no. I can say it nicely. I can say it nicely. I can also say fuck no. I can always say fuck no. Are you going to go away forever? Are you going to go away forever? Because I don't need you anymore. Because I appreciate you, but I don't need you anymore. I'm a woman in my 40s. I'm a woman in my 40s. I'm strong. I'm strong. I'm powerful. I am powerful. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm independent. I'm independent. I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever I want. And until I can say no. And until I can say no. Yes has no meaning at all. Yes has no meaning at all. And it's often disguised no. And it often is a disguised no. And I'm going to say no a lot. And I'm going to say no a lot. And as I do that, are you now leaving forever? And as I do that, are you now leaving forever? What does the headache say? Yes. And how will you know it's gone? Um, Because I will be saying no and (laughs) pain-free. Yeah, because the pain is the pain of saying Mm. yes when you mean no. Mm. The pain is the pain of thinking, God, I still feel like I'm seven. Just like putting up the freaking tent. I've got to turn up at this event, go to this meeting. You couldn't say no when you were seven. You couldn't say no when your parents went on holiday. And when you have to say no and you want to say yes, you get a headache to remind you of the pain. Mm. But the truth is you'll never be that seven-year-old girl ever again. You don't need to be reminded. You haven't got time for the pain. Mm -mm. Because as you learn to say no and yes, when it suits you, and say, that doesn't work for me, that doesn't suit me, I'm not available, I'm not free, I have other plans, thanks for asking, but... No, you never need that pain around your eye or your jaw because it disables you. You don't need it. Mm. Nothing to do with dehydration, to do with expectations that you feel you can't meet but have to meet. Mm. They remind you of being seven. So I want you to go, I'm not seven. I'm not seven. I want you to imagine, go back to that scene with a little girl with a tent. Imagine you're off with someone. They let's put up a tent and they start saying to you, Kelly, it's all wrong. And I want you to say, oh, fuck the tent. I'm going to a hotel. <laughs> fuck off. I want I'm you to, to say, I'm not seven. 
I'm not seven. That little girl isn't me. That little girl isn't me. And I never have to do that again. And I never have to do that again. I don't have to put up tents. I don't have to put up tents. I don't have to be shouted at. I don't have to be shouted at. I don't have to be embarrassed in front of my friends. I don't have to be embarrassed in front of my friends. Because I'm not seven. Because I'm not seven. And in not being seven, I can walk away. And in not being seven, I can walk away. I can be super chilled. I can be super chilled. Because I'm going to do whatever I want. Because I'm going to do whatever I want. I was a dependent seven-year-old. I was a dependent seven-year-old. I'm an independent woman in my 40s. I'm an independent woman in my 40s. And I'm powerful. And I'm powerful. And I'm strong. And I'm strong. And fuck the headaches. And fuck the headaches. I want you to go back to the scene where you're lying in bed and your parents are fighting. Imagine if you went home for the week with Riley to stay with someone who was screaming. You'd just say, you know, I'm going to go to a hotel. Mm-hmm. I get in an Uber, I'm going home. Or I go out and say, guys, knock it off. This is really inappropriate. Isn't that right? Yes. And the little girl, if your parents go on holiday now, do you cry? No. Do you think they're going to die? No. So I want you to go, I'm not that little kid. I'm not that little kid. Who cried. Who cried. Who needed them to stay. Who needed them to stay. I'm not that kid who lay in bed feeling helpless. I'm not that kid who lay in bed feeling helpless. And angry. And angry. And I'm not the kid with a tent. And I'm not the kid with a tent. That's not me. (laughs) That's not me. And will never be me ever again. And will never be me ever again. For the rest of my long, gorgeous life. For the rest of my long, gorgeous life. Because. Because. Tell me why that isn't you. I'm a powerful, independent woman in my 40s. And I love saying no. And I love saying no. It thrills me to say no. It thrills me to say no. It elates me to say no. It elates me to say no. It delights me to say no. It delights me to say no. I can say it nicely. I can say it nicely. I can say it any way I like. I can say it any way I like. Because it's true. Because it's true. I get to say no. I get to say no. I get to choose what to say. I get to choose what to say. And I get to choose... How I feel about it. And I get to choose how I feel about it. And I choose to say it. And I choose to say it. And to take away the role of the headaches forever. And to take away the role of the headaches forever. Because they're all redundant now. Because they're all redundant now. Let's just do one more thing for two minutes. I want you to wrap your arm around that little girl who's so upset about the tent. And I want you to imagine taking her back to where you live, where beautiful little Riley lives and you know that when you have a little kid they say no a lot no they don't want to eat the food they say no they clamp their jaws they spit it out babies say no way more than they say yes and I want you to imagine taking that little Kelly back with you and as you walk through I want you to say out loud I'm upgrading you into my world now I'm upgrading you into my world now. And this is a nicer place. (laughs) And this is a nicer place. This is a better place. This is a better place. This is a safer place. This is a safer place. There's no putting up tents. There's no putting up tents. Listening to people screaming. Listening to people screaming. Or crying when your parents go on holiday. Or crying when your parents go on holiday. You live in my world. You live in my world. And I want you to imagine taking little Kelly room by room. And seeing that you have an amazing life and as you upgrade her into your life, as you show her the world you live in now, you can't go back into the other world, not even in your daydreams. And I want you to do one more thing. I want you to say, I'm becoming a loving parent to you now. I'm becoming a loving parent to you now. No one in the world can play this part like I can. No one in the world can play this part like I can. I love you just the way you are. I love you just the way you are. And as a loving parent. And as a loving parent. I let you fail. I let you fail. I let you get things wrong. I let you get things wrong. Because that's how you learn. Because that's how you learn. And I'm just here supporting you. And I'm just here supporting you. Believing in you. Believing in you. Loving you. Loving you. And letting you say no. And letting you say no. If you could become a loving parent of that little Kelly and install her in your home so that you've upgraded her to your world and you've created a place in your heart, in your body, in your life, in your home for her, what does she need to hear more than anything else in the world when you were seven, nine? What did you need to hear so much? Uh, You are enough. Yeah, you're enough. What else? I love you. I love you. What else? Um, you don't you don't need to be perfect yeah you don't need to be perfect you never need to be perfect don't even try to be perfect there's no happiness there it's not important to be perfect it's important to be happy Mm -hmm. it's not important to have a perfect home or a perfect body 
are perfect. That's important to be happy. And failure is not final. Mistakes no. are learning. Yeah. So there's a thing the called my path. friend failure. My friend failure. Mm. You know, many years ago I got a job on a TV show and I realized I had to get so excited about a banana muffin. I thought, oh God, I could never do this job. I thought I'd love being a host on a morning show. When I did it, I thought, oh no, I could never do this. It just wasn't my thing. I couldn't do it. I had great respect for people who can. And I thought, well, that's good. I learned what I shouldn't do. I learned it wasn't for me. The failure was my friend said, Marissa, this is not for you. Therapy is for you. You don't want to be a TV anchor person. <laughs> great people who can do it, but it's not your gift. And only when you fail do you learn, that's not for me. You know, if you hadn't failed, you'd be dating the first boy you ever dated. Would you like that? No. To still be with him? <laughs> no. You might be in the first job you ever had. What was the first job you ever had when you were at school? Oh, gosh. I was a hostess at a restaurant. Would you like to still be doing that? No. So in failing at those things, in that relationship failing, didn't you learn what wasn't for you? Yes. And what was for you found you just mm -hmm. as surely as you found it. Mm -hmm. So say to that little girl, you live in my world. You live in my world. It's okay to fail. It's okay to fail. It's actually quite nice sometimes it's to fail. It's actually quite nice sometimes to fail. And you can't fail. And you can't fail. The only way you can fail is failing to try. The only way you can fail is failing to try. Failing to try is the same as trying to fail. Failing to try is trying to fail? Yeah. And you've already succeeded. You got a book, a daughter, a husband, a life. You're gorgeous and smart. You can't fail because you've already won. So f fearing the thing you've already won at is just going backwards. And you're not going backwards, you're going forward. So for the last minute as you go deeper, as you go deeper, drift deeper, sink deeper, you're okay that every day you are moving on from one phenomenal, incredible accomplishment to another. Every day you're moving on from one achievement. And some of that achievement is like just staying home and having a bath and just being with you. Every day you are thrilled, elated, delighted, empowered when you say no no thank you, no that doesn't work, or oh fuck no. Every day, as you say no, as you realize you've already won and that being a flawed person, having flawed relations with flawed people, being flawsome is such a gift for you because in letting yourself be flawed, you're bringing up your little girl to see it's okay to fail, it's okay to go, so it's okay to fall out, it's okay that your painting wasn't the best or someone did better. In letting yourself be flawed, you are giving Riley the biggest gift because your father tried to make you perfect and you couldn't do it. It was an impossible expectation when you're seven. You don't have those skills. When you were seven, Kelly, you came to conclusion. When you've been on the planet for seven years, you formed a belief. Got to be perfect or it upsets people. And today you think, well, that's a silly belief. It's not even true. Perfect people actually alienate people. The belief that I've got to be perfect will upset people. Perfect people are the loneliest people, the unhappiest people. And they don't thrill people, they alienate them. They go, oh, I can't hang around with that person. They're perfect, they may feel inadequate. Flawed people are where you want to be <laughs> because we're all flawed anyway. So as you look over and around those scenes, you see the truth. You came to a conclusion with seven years of life experience. And now as you look over and around that, you see the truth. It will never again, never, ever, ever, ever again for the rest of your long, gorgeous life be relevant or necessary. It would be interesting for you to ever again think the way you thought at seven, feel the way you felt at nine, or act the way you acted at four, because that's not you. It's behind you, it's like the water in the shower you last took and you can't run home and get that even if you want it because it's already gone. It's something you used to do and it cannot, will not, does not influence you or even interest you for the rest of your life. The rest of your long, gorgeous, happy, headache-free life, Kelly. <laughs> You've got this, understanding is power. And as you understand the role those headaches played, you understand you never need to have them again, not ever. Because you can take a deep breath. You can say, oh, I'm not saying no enough this week. I'm not saying fuck off enough, even in my head. 
So I better go back and do that more because you are free. You have freedom. You have empowerment. You have understanding. You got all of this with bells on. And it's just about a little girl who couldn't meet impossible expectations. Who's become a beautiful woman that doesn't want impossible expectations and is very aware of passing it on to her daughter, to your audience. You're doing everyone here the biggest favor in the world as you show them. Let's not grow up with impossible expectations because they're impossible. Let's grow up and be kind and be real and say, yeah, well, that wasn't meant to be. That didn't work out. Sometimes I say no to stuff because what I want already wants me. What I'm moving towards is moving. I don't have to work at it. I just have to let it be. You're a human being, not a human doing. And that means you can be, you can chill, you can turn things down, you can stop pleasing people, but you can definitely please yourself. And in that is your freedom. So just take a deep breath and open your eyes. <sighs> How do you feel? <laughs> I mean, I feel worried that I'm, oh, I'm so late to pick up my daughter. I thought maybe somebody else might have gone to get her. No, that's okay. I got to go now, but yeah, of course. that's me people pleasing. I'm not saying fuck off. I'm just saying I have to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we, can, <laughs> we can talk on the phone. We should that was unbelievable. Quick, okay. Do I need to like come out of it? That no, no, you came out of it yourself. Okay. It's fine. Well, you just close your eyes. Okay. And just one, two, three, four, five, come back to your full awareness, feeling amazing, feeling liberated, feeling free. Just open your eyes. So now you know. You yeah. can never say again, I don't know what that is. That was, it was unbelievable. The hurt, it was the anger, it was the rage. You know, outrage is rage coming out. Yeah. But that isn't you. And now you can live without them because you don't need them. That was amazing. That was really incredible. Good. Thank you. Good. You're welcome. Wow. Um, that was, I didn't want to rush it, but I was like, I got to go. I know. I, but that was so beautiful. It was really powerful. But also I, in the rushing, we, you can do this so quickly. Yeah. I was going really quickly too, because yeah. I knew you had an appointment to pick up Riley. But, but just even the, the insights and, still yeah. Works. And again, I just want to disclaimer, my dad is a wonderful human. I love you. Um, and again, he was, he was as hard was on himself as everybody else. It was you know, his stuff, exactly. Here's this weird belief. I should be born to mature parents. Our parents grow up with us. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. We think, they know, you know, yeah. your dad's a great guy. So is your mum. But yeah. they are flawed people. Yeah. It's and awesome. they raised you in a flawed way so that you thought you were broken and damaged. But you're not. You just had a bit of damaged parenting. But nobody can get it right. And look, it just, you know, I turned out okay. Like, and your dad's I'm healthy. And he's a great know? guy. So And his parents made him try to be perfect. Exactly. But you in parenting Riley go... Darling, it's okay to fail. You don't like yeah. ballet? It wasn't your thing. You you learned you were not good at that. It wasn't your thing. But in this session and healing myself and becoming aware of those mm -hmm. things and letting go and, and, I mean, just unfolding all that and yeah, unpacking, it. unpacking it. And now to show up in a different way for Riley and be oh, more conscious so nice. and yeah, more loving her. of her like I am my sure. inner child. It's just Because, you know, really children learn what they live. There's no choice. Mm -hmm. you, learn, you lived in a house where, ex where perfectionism was expected yeah. and you knew you couldn't meet it. And now you live in a house where it's okay to get And when I make wrong. a mistake, exactly. And those are the, going to be the things <coughs> and experiences that shape her and of give course. her her gifts okay. and expression. And she'll have to unpack her stuff. But we're, we're humans. We're flawed. Yeah. We all do it. I mean, yeah. Sorry, I have I to know run. You have to go. Don't um, get under pressure. Where Just can go. people find you? Oh, MarissaPeer.com is where I am. And we have a lot of free audios on money blocks, love blocks, health blocks. It's totally free. Go to MarissaPeer.com for free stuff. Go to RTT. If you want to come and train with me and do what I do, no background wow. therapy is required. And then we're on Instagram and we're everywhere. But Thank you. If you, Thank want to, you want to find a great therapist or be a great therapist. If you want to find one or be one, go to rtt.com. If you want lots of free stuff, go to marissapeer.com. Amazing. Well, this has been a massive gift. I did not expect that. Thank yeah. you so much. And um, yeah. Let's all be flawsome. Let's all the be flawsome. The best you can ever be. Yes. It's a great place to be. Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in every Thursday for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. And make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And please rate and review us so that we can grow and reach more people. Thanks so much and be well.